So as everybody knows, we use ashes on Ash Wednesday. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Ashes equal death. They remind us of what we are and where we're going. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But at the same time, we are obviously more than ashes and dust. Because every person who has ever lived, or ever will live, is this tiny ember of unending life that is shining in a universe of death. How weird is that? Now, I wonder if you've really thought that through. Literally 100% of the matter in the universe is dead, dying, or was never alive in the first place. Nothing in the universe lasts, not even the stars. So, if we existed in a purely materialistic universe, death would be the most natural thing in the world. But it's not. At least not to us. For us, it's the most unnatural thing in the world. When we see a dead tree in the woods, we think, eh, that's nature. When someone dies, we think things very differently, don't we? You know, and why is that? Why do we so adamantly refuse to respect the rules of this universe, which obviously apply to us like anything else? <laughs> well, the reason is, we may live in this universe and subject to all the laws of the universe, but we don't belong here. We are strangers in a strange land. We are exiles. We belong with God. We belong in our true homeland, which we can all but inadequately describe as heaven. And that's why nothing in the universe is ever going to make you happy. No thing in the universe will ever make you truly happy. Number one way people fail to understand that? Money. I will be truly happy if only I had a million dollars. Well, we know that doesn't work. When people genuinely think that and make their first million, they realize that they actually need two million, and then it's five million, and so on. The other common error that people fall into is achievement. I will be whole and complete as a person if only I can achieve this great thing. We also know that doesn't work. Last month we had the Olympics, right? Well, uh, the uh, women's figure skating, the gold medalist, was a uh, Russian teenager, I believe she was 15, uh, named Anna. Uh, she has a last name, but uh, I have no chance of pronouncing it correctly, so I'm not even gonna try. Um, so Anna won the, the, the absolute pinnacle of athletic excellence. She got a gold medal at the Olympics before she can drive a car. How awesome is that? So the, uh, the media, of course, interviewed her, and they said, wow, like, you won the Olympics, you know, for your sport. How does that feel? And she said, and I am not making this up, she said, I feel so empty inside. I feel sorry for her. I really do. I wish she could have reveled in her moment more. She earned it. Um, but it just goes to show you that worldwide fame and the absolute excellence of athletic ability will not actually make you a more fulfilled or complete human being. The thrills and satisfaction that things of this world can provide, it will wear off. Sooner or later, things of this world will wear off. But underneath all of that stuff, every one of you, whether you believe this or not, every single one of you has a desire. It's right there in the core of your being. And this desire, you couldn't put into words exactly what you are desiring, but it's something that this world cannot provide. C.S. Lewis described it as a, a, a little nightingale 
that singing in the, in the very bottom of your soul, I know this isn't a nightingale, this is the closest thing I had. Um, so this little nightingale is singing for its food at the very bottom of your soul. And the problem is, we don't always feed the nightingale because we don't always hear the nightingale because there are all these other animals clomping around in our souls. Okay, I've got this big old monkey on my back and he's hungry. Well, you better believe I'm going to feed the monkey because he's heavy and loud and obnoxious. So I feed him monkey food. And I kind of hope that the nightingale will be fed as well, but the problem is a nightingale doesn't eat monkey food. Um, so the nightingale goes hungry. And furthermore, I don't just have a monkey to worry about. I've also got a dog and a ferret and a walrus and a duck-billed platypus, and all of them are squawking for their food. And all of those other animals are all the desires I have of, of living and existing in this world. All right, they're my desires for food, shelter, um, acceptance, fun and amusement, uh, a million dollars, a gold medal at the Olympics. And all day long, I'm feeding all of these animals. I could spend literally all day, every day, just feeding these animals. And the problem is, I will never actually feed the nightingale by doing that. Because none of these you know, other animals will really satisfy my deepest longing. Because this nightingale at the bottom of your soul, that is your desire for absolute, unending joy, love, and fulfillment. And only God can feed that desire because God is the only thing that is more than the world. So what does that have to do with Ash Wednesday and Lent? Well. Lent is our time to remember and act upon the fact that most of the world is ashes and monkey food. Chocolate is monkey food. You don't need it. Your smartphone that you cannot live without anymore is monkey food. It will not actually make you happy. Wine with dinner? definitely monkey food. Popularity at school, monkey food. You don't need it. Lent is a time for us to go on a diet from monkey food and take a little more time to eat some bird seed. It's not as enjoyable, it's not as, as, uh, as fun of a meal, but it will actually nourish the most important part of us. Lent is a time to put the monkey on time out. Don't worry, he's going to be fine and nourish that nightingale of faith. I got just enough time to, to wrap up. I want to make one more thing clear. There are two general benefits when someone is authentically feeding that nightingale of faith. Two things will happen because bear in mind that full desire, you know, absolute fulfillment and love, that doesn't happen until you die and you go to heaven. As long as you're in this universe of death, that desire can only be partially fulfilled. But when you feed that nightingale of faith, there are two benefits to doing so. One, you grow in joy. When you feed that nightingale of faith and when you understand that your homeland is far from here and it's far better, that joy radiates in throughout your entire being. And the second thing that happens when your nightingale is singing and is healthy, you grow in fearlessness. Because when you know that you belong to God and that heaven is your true homeland, the dangers and threats and enemies of this world, well, they're not quite so threatening anymore. And you become brave and steadfast in faith. Because the most important part of you is healthy and nourished and sustains the rest of you. I'll wrap up with a quote from uh, Victor Hugo, another writer I dearly love. Uh, he said, um, the, 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 
he didn't call it a nightingale, but the nightingale of the soul sings and sustains the body. Your soul is the only bird which sustains its own cage.